Hi everyone, it is October 5th and today's Wednesday. We are at the Chaos DEI Working Group meeting. I'm Elizabeth, the Chaos Community Manager. Um, just to make it clear, we do not care at any Chaos meeting. If you have your camera on or off, uh, you're free to participate however is more comfortable for you. So if you would prefer to con communicate in the chat, that's completely fine. You do not have to uh, do, you know, just do whatever feels right for you. So just want to make that clear in case there's any confusion. I'm going to share my screen here so we can get started on the agenda. Uh, if you would like to put your name on here, you are welcome to do so. We would love that. If you don't, that's also completely valid. You do not have to record your participation in any way. It's totally fine. Um, and I'm curious to know if you are an early morning person or a late night person. I see a few early mornings there. Anybody a late night? I'm a depends. It depends on what's going on. If I'm doing something, then I'll probably stay up late. But sometimes my brain just wakes up like today, for instance, 447 AM, my brain is like, Oh, you should get up and do stuff. And of course, I didn't because I'm like, No, it's 447 in the morning, I'm not doing that. So I laid there until about eight. So <laughs> just scrolled, just, you know, checked email, did whatever. Yeah, right, Nikki, I'm with you. Yes, 100%. Like, did they not get the memo that, you know, you you can sleep. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> I guess they got little bladders and little bellies that need full. <laughs> okay, so first thing is to pick a facilitator for next week. Does anybody want to try to do that? We do have some documentation to help you if you've never done that before and you'd like to give it a shot. This is a great meeting to try that out just because like we're pretty, it's pretty, pretty easy here, pretty flexible. I could facilitate that. Enik, was that you? Mm-hmm. Awesome. You are volunteered. Thank you yep. for doing that. All right. And so um, jumping in then to the agenda, do we want, sometimes we go around and just see how everyone's doing. Do we want to do that today? We, we have a pretty light agenda. Maybe we could go around and just do a quick intro um, for people who don't know who people are. Okay, that'd be good. I'll go ahead and start since I'm already blabbering away. I'm Elizabeth again, and I'm the community manager here at Chaos. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, hence my Bengals. I am a Bengals fan. Um, that's the football team here. So um, yes, I'm very excited. We've won two games and we've lost two games. So yeah. It's a little sketchy. We don't know how the rest of the season is going to go, but we're hopeful. Anyway, I will pass it along to Nikki since they're the next one on my list. Um, good morning. I am Nikki. I use they them pronouns. I live in um, Vermont um, and I have a lot of friends who are Bengals fans. And so congratulations. Uh, I, I'm glad they're doing well. Um, and I'm a software engineer and an academic. Um, and I will pass it on to um, Anita. Hey everyone, I'm Anita Hickman. I'm a developer advocate and a technical writer. I'm currently in Nigeria and um, I'm doing great. So I'll pass it on to Cade. I hope I pronounced that right. All right. Um, Um, is Kevin on the call? Oh, uh, yep, I'm here. All right. Hi, Kate. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Kevin uh, Lombard. I'm an academic. I'm uh, located in uh, Nebraska at the University of Nebraska Omaha. Uh, I work with uh, I work with Matt and Sean, who aren't on this call currently. Uh, I've been with Chaos uh, since the beginning, actually. 
and I will pass it on to but Blythe or Blythe? Blythe or Blythe? It's Blythe. Blythe, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, hi, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I'm finishing up my last year at UTK um, for data analytics, and I have my associates in software programming from Pellissippi. Um, sorry if you hear a little voice in the background. My daughter's here. She's homesick today. <laughs> So she thinks it's fun to jump on these calls. <laughs> um, uh, about me, um, not much to know about me. Pretty much, I just go to school all my life. Um, I am a UTK fan. I'm from Detroit originally, so I feel you. We never win lines, or so I'm not really a pro ball fan. <laughs> it's pretty much just disappointment. But UT is doing pretty good. We won against Florida, so that's pretty amazing for us. Um, and I don't see anybody else on the chat, so I'll pass it on to whoever. Has Victoria gone yet? I'm still here. Okay. Hello, guys. Um, I'm Victoria. I'm a product designer, accessibility advocate, and a technical writer. I'm in Nigeria and I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. And I think Enoch, you're, you're the final one, I think. He who loves last loves best. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm excited to hear a lot of uh, folks here saying, I'm a software engineer, software engineer. I'm like, whoa. That's cool. Um, Enoch, um, I'm a chaotic from um, Uganda. That's um, the eastern part of Africa. And um, I'm actually here to catch up. It's been long um, while, I was, um, while I was away from the DEI meetings and um, hoping to catch up on a lot of updates um, throughout this call and uh, preceding calls. Yep, happy to be here. I'm a software engineer too. Nice to meet Nikki and um, the other name that I'm failing to also pronounce, but it's whole, I should say. So um, nice to meet you, everybody. All right, awesome. I have also missed the last two DEI working group meetings, so I'll probably rely on you all to help <laughs> fill in because I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, but yeah, so let's start with the first thing on the agenda, which I just copied from last time. Um, I had dropped this on, even though I wasn't attending, I dropped it on just to see if this was something that um, sounded interesting to people. So um, I think, yeah, so I just copied it literally from last time. Could, it seems like the idea was pretty well received. If anybody was here and wants to fill in some context there, or if there was any action items. I think the uh, so the idea was pretty well received. Uh, I don't I don't know that I'm the one to to fill in the context on this, uh, but I think there is uh, one of the things that we had talked about was making this document part of the website new contributor page. Um, and I'm not based on what's here now. I think that that may involve just a little bit of. Uh, uh, imagination to make it work, because I, I think the, as it's described, it's it's described a little bit more as a as a, a checklist that would exist in each repository. Uh, I think maybe maybe Elizabeth or, or someone else can speak to that. What would it look like? What would this look like on the website? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So in my mind, I was thinking of, so when I joined a company, um, this was something they had me do as a new employee, obviously contributors to an open source project, that's a different situation, but the functions the same, you know, there are certain tasks that you had to do. And so when I did this, they had me open an issue in my own repository and then copy the checklist into an issue just in my own repository. And so um, then I could just kind of go through it on my own time and um, check things off. And it was very clear and I didn't have to keep um, like I didn't have to ask anybody else what the next step would be. I could just go down my list. 
Um, so that's kind of where it came from. Um, when I was thinking about that, though, I wasn't sure if that would work as an issue or if it would be better to have an, an MD file that somebody could just copy and plop in their own re repository. Um, I don't know, um, but it seems like it would be better um, focused on the website and not so GitHub specific. So um, I think that seemed like what the, the feedback was from last time. Um, so let me let me just put an action item here for myself. And if anybody wants to do this with me, that's totally fine. Um, just think about how this could look on the website and what the flow would be. We do do similar things too, like for um, for our mentees. Uh, I think an outreachy we had a, a list. I don't remember now. <laughs> I don't remember now. Um, but there was like a list of things to do and it was exactly like this like attend a meeting attend the community meeting or um, read through the handbook join slack like all of those things were things that um, would help you kind of get set up to be a part of the community so um, any kind of ideas on what would be in that checklist also uh, are welcome what I could do is maybe start a doc and bring it back to this group just for um, for more eyes on it. Would that work for people? That way we have like a place to start anyway. Works for me. Okay. I don't want to speak for everyone else though. I'm going to assign me meeting to do. There we go. Assign to me. If I don't do this, I will completely forget that this is a thing that I'm supposed to do. <laughs> you all want to hear a funny story? So I know I'm just going to digress for a minute because I can't believe I did this. I, my brain, like, I don't remember things at all, at all. So if, if I forget something that like a conversation we've had, it is definitely not anything against you. I literally brought a package in yesterday from the front porch, completely forgot that I did that. And when I saw the email that the package was delivered, I was like, I didn't get any package. What are they talking about? I'm like, I must've gone somewhere else. Someone's getting my stuff. So I'm like, you know, going through, trying to track it, trying to get the picture. There was no picture. I'm like, oh man. So I'm like, well, maybe the camera, I have a front porch camera. I was like, maybe that caught it. So I go to my camera and like, there's me bringing the package inside. <laughs> like, what, what am I even doing with my life? I don't even know. So yeah. <laughs> so if I forget something, <laughs> please don't, don't hold it against me. I'm so sorry. It's just my brain. I don't know. I don't understand. Anyway, I'm really glad that this is being recorded too. So <laughs> future employees or employers don't don't watch this anyway. Um, okay, so is there anything else that anybody wants to bring up with regard to this kind of idea of like having a checklist where people could just kind of go and start and do their thing on their own. Cool. All right. Well, let's move on then. Um, Anita, do you have an update? If you don't, that's also completely valid. I, again, copied this from last time. So if you do have an update, um, we'd love to hear it. If you don't, that's cool too. It looks like Anita, oh, are you back? Yeah, sorry, I got disconnected. Um, did I miss anything? Yeah, I had actually just um, passed it along to you <laughs> for an update, conveniently enough. <laughs> so um, if you do have an update on the interview campaign, great. If you don't, that's also completely fine. We can't hear you if you're talking, sorry. Okay, I think Anita might be having some audio issues, maybe.
Okay, Anita, we'll come back to you. If your audio starts working again, let us know. And um, oh, I think she might have gotten booted again. Oh, shucks. Okay, well, we'll come back. Um, so the next thing on here is new metrics. So it looks like we were working on this last time. It looks like Matt got this pretty well set, the newcomer experience. And he's just going to go through these check. So for those who don't know, whenever we develop a new metric, so we will uh, we start out in a Google Doc and we have a template that we work from, um, and we all get together in a group in one of these meetings and we help define this metric together. We all just work in this doc in a Google Doc together, and then once we get it to a point after maybe a couple of meetings, a couple of iterations. Um, we decide that we're going to release this metric like it's pretty good to go we've had a lot of feedback on it and a lot of people contributing. Um, so this is the next step, and that is to open an issue in the working group, whatever working group it is open an issue in this working group. And then we have a checklist that we go through so to make sure that we've kind of checked all our boxes to make sure the metric is where it needs to be with regard to process and quality and all of these things like make sure that links work make sure headings are right like all of that kind of stuff so that's what this is that we're looking at right now for those who may not know and then once we make sure it's all good then it will go on the website for um public viewing and feedback comments so it looks like uh, matt's already here on this one i'm just going through that work um, recognizing contributions still needs to be done. So do we have, we do not have a template for that one, I don't think. Does anyone know if we started that last time? Let's see. We have a, um, we have this metrics tracking sheet that we also use to keep everything together kind of in one place with regard to all of the metrics that are in progress that have been released and then you can see down here we have them listed by working group so now we're on the dei one and we're looking at what were we looking at i don't even remember see i don't remember <laughs> it's been literally 30 seconds so i don't remember recognizing contributions that's what we're doing okay And here it is. So this says it's under community review. Does anyone know if that's the truth? <laughs> like I don't know why. I don't know why it says that. Because I didn't think we had done it, but I'm confused now. I'm confused as well. Um is there a, so if it's under review, then there should be a uh, markdown document created in the uh, uh, DEI re repository to correspond with this. So that would be the, the easy way to check and see if it's under review is to check the, see if that document exists and also to uh, see if there's an issue that corresponds with it. Okay, let's check that for a second. Uh, what was that under? That was under what people? People, project and community. Okay, so let's go over here to our focus areas, project and community. I do not see it. The key. So it's not under community, <laughs> under community okay. review. Do we want to take, I mean, this kind of looks like it's been worked on. So the other, the other question I would have about this one is how, how is this one different from contribution attribution, which exists in the evolution working group, right? So does this, yeah. does this metric already exist in another working group is my question. Uh, and if this, if it, uh, if this is, different from that that metric that already exists how is it different i see we've we've referenced these others 
Um, contribution attribution. Yeah. So right here in the description, yeah. okay. we are recognize we are referencing it. Contribution attribution. Right. Let's look at that. This metric evaluates who has worked on the project and specific project tasks. Hmm. Who's contributed to an open source project and what attribution information about people? So, hmm. Is attributing the work or like giving someone credit for the work that they've done, is that the same as recognizing them or um, what's the word I want? I don't know. What do you all think? There's an open source community recognizes careers. So I think there might be a difference. So I'm thinking of a project that has um, like uh, visibility into who maybe who the top contributors are as a separate thing from here's the work that this person's done, here's the work that this person's done. Does that make sense? Like they're giving they're giving a little extra recognition, a little extra bonus of visibility and thanks and appreciation, maybe. What do you all think? So this one is about the mechanisms that are in place to recognize contributors rather than rather it's not a measure of who the contributors are uh, and what they've done, which would be contribution attribution. Yeah. Uh, this one is a measure of what mechanisms are in place yeah. to recognize contributors. Uh, so I, I think I think I, I get that subtly, subtly from this document. I don't think I get it uh, explicitly at, at the at the beginning anyway. So maybe maybe if we could make that more explicit. Yeah. Um, in the description. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, so we get to, in that description, we get that first sentence, which says recognizing contributors is important for how a project acknowledges. Uh, so that, that sentence actually is better, better fits in the objectives. So the, the description in, uh, for these documents, the, the description should be a very, very explicitly describe what this metric is and what it measures. And then the, the reason that the metric is important or the goal or the objectives of the metric uh, is a better fit in that second paragraph. So I know we, we sometimes get, uh, we, we sometimes uh, with the description, we sometimes get a little, uh, we, we jump into that objective a little bit early. Uh, but so I, I would, that first sentence, I would maybe, Uh, move to the objectives. You, What's you said it should give reasons why it's important and give. No, the uh, objective. Because... The objective gives the reason why it's important, oh. and the and the possible uses for it. Right. So the objectives, the goals, things of that nature. The description should very. It should very explicitly describe what the metric is, and what the metric is measuring. I think narratively we narratively we often like to like give the importance of something and then and then provide I think, I think narratively people just like to write that way but with our with our yeah. template it's not uh the importance of this metric and the objective for the metric is that second part so this the description is it's just it's very explicitly what this metric is and what it measures uh so and if if we keep it that way uh we have the ability to uh, you know, really say what this metric is and what this metric isn't at the very beginning. So we don't run into the, the problem of, uh, you know, how is this one different from contribution attribution or, yeah. so this is that, this is that place where we can really make that distinction. 
Okay, so a uh, question for the group. Do we want to take time and work on this doc a little more right now? Do we have somebody who wants to do it off offline? Just kind of take that action item to just add that stuff in? Or what do we want to do with this? I do say, uh, I see Anita is back. Do we want to jump back to the, uh, the previous uh, item and then come back to this yeah. one if we have time? Yeah, I like that a lot. Let's do that. So Anita, we're going to jump back up here. Um, if you have anything to update, yeah. All right. Um, so I noticed that um, Nikki and um, Sophia left comments. So I wanted us to discuss it in the in the meeting as well, so we can get more thoughts on it. So and which doc um, should I go to? The um, interview um, questions and guide. Yes, yeah, so if you scroll down to the initial questions, there are some notes that are left there. And um, the one that I actually need to talk more on is the race and ethnicity background. So Nikki, I don't, I don't know if you could sh um, throw more light on this because I wanted to know how else you can um, represent this in the questions without having to, um, be biased about the entire thing. Yeah, that's a, um, I think that's a great question. Sorry, my dogs are a little activated. Uh, so you might hear them in the background. Um, I think for me, the question is really about like, um, if we're, if we're gonna collect it, it's, it's very possible because communities are so small, we don't need to collect it at all. <clears throat> we can instead ask people, do you identify as a racial or ethnic minority in the communities that you're in? Um, and that'll be enough to help us get some insight on whether this person is giving us a, like a racialized perspective on a DEI metric. Um, but, I, but I think what's tricky is that in a North American context, um, we need to be really careful about whether or not we call somebody black or African-American or African or Jamaican right, or Kenya, like all of those things are so separate to how um, in general we're thinking about race here. Um, certainly that's not true globally. Um, and so I think maybe it's like, I need more information about how we're even gonna use race or ethnicity um, in our analysis and whether what we're actually asking for is, are you, right, are you black? Or if what we're asking for is, are you giving us insights that come from a black American experience? Does, if, does that make sense? Yeah. So um, the reason why we included this is just wanted to see the different um, opinions of people based on the um, underrepresented group and how the sales message um, affect them or influence how they participate in the process. I'm having trouble hearing. Sorry, can you hear me? Oh my goodness. Oh, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. All right. So yeah, we included this because it's um like part of the. We just want to see how these different underrepresented groups, based on how these persons identify, or these people that under identify under this underrepresented group, are affected by these metrics, and that's why we included this. But um. So if I get what you were trying to say correctly, um, I say we should uh, separate the race or the ethnicity or we shouldn't include it at all. Yeah, I think leaving it out is hard, right? Like uh, uh, other surveys that leave race and ethnicity out really get slammed for it. So I don't know that, I'm not saying we should not ask it. I think I'm just saying um, that we can either separate them out or we can um, simply make it free text and let people identify in ways that they feel comfortable and that they feel safe to identify given the context in which they're answering the question. All right, so we should take out the options then. 
Great. All right. Thanks for that. All right. So the next one I also want to further discuss on is um, the gender spectrum they identify as. So you say we should talk about the shorter version of how we can phrase that question. So like, a real, you might explain. Real quick, I'm, I'm sorry, before you move on to the next one. Uh, so uh, uh, accepting free text in, in the in this in this part of the survey for the racial and ethnic background will make it very, very difficult to analyze. Uh, so if so, we may if the if the goal is to uh, when you're doing the analysis, if the goal is to uh, categorize or separate these different types of responses, you may want to think about that in how you build that that selector where it's you know maybe you have two or three selections and a free text box uh, that'll that'll help with the analysis down the line. So I, I, I mean I hear you, Kevin, and we're gonna we're gonna get into free text problems again when we talk about gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I think the thing that I wonder about, <coughs> excuse me, is whether or not, um, you know, Anita, I hear your point of like, we want to know how X metric affects someone with X identity. Um, <coughs> but I think one of the things, certainly when we ask about race and gender, when we ask about gender, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things that we're really asking is not, are you trans, but are you a person who has spent time living under gender oppression? Um, a lot of times. Um, or are you a person who experiences medical gatekeeping with regard to care, rather than caring whether or not someone is trans? And so it's very possible that one of the things we can do is rather than giving a ton of free text boxes, ask those questions really specifically, right? Um, are you a person who had to do a legal name change? Are you a person who doesn't have access to healthcare that makes you feel good in your body, right? Um, and that might help with analysis as well, because in general, we want to give people a free text box to type in right there, their gender and their sexuality. I think that to me, that sounds like a, uh, a better idea because one of the, one of the other problems we have with that, the analysis on the back end is that we move the, with the free text box scenario, we kind of move the, we move the bias to the analysis, right? Because then it becomes the, uh, the, the researchers, decision on how they categorize people into these different buckets and, and what those buckets may mean regarding the question. So I um, explicitly asking those questions the way Nikki is describing uh, is, uh, I think, it, I think that would be a better option. All right. Um, does that also include the gender spectrum as on the racist, racial and ethnic? I mean, I think so. Um, I'm less, certainly less qualified to talk about race in a global context, um, but but I think to Kevin's point, if what we want is a want way to do analysis, then asking questions that are specifically about an assumed experience will make that easier than just saying, check this box if you're X. Okay. Okay. So um, I have a quick question. Sorry, Anita, I have a quick question for you or Nikki or whoever. Um, so these initial screening questions says this will be an open survey to scout for interview subjects. So is the idea that this would be the thing that like the results from these questions or what we're doing our analysis on? Or are these just like uh, get to know your questions that are going to lead us to the people we want to interview and that's where we're going to get our data. Yeah, that that's, these are the get to know questions that will lead us to the individuals. So this, so like this individuals yeah. up to participate like or request for the follow up, which is something I also wanted to bring up because Sophia left a comment about the um, follow up um, calls. So yeah, these individuals would either, if they indicate interest for the follow up conversations, then we um, proceed from there. But this is just to get like the overall data. 
So my my prior understanding of this when we when it's been discussed in the past is that this demographic information was going to be connected to responses. Uh, yes. to specific responses and that understanding the demographics of these people uh, and connecting it to their responses was an important part of uh, this uh, uh, research. Well, yes, because okay. if you check the questions that were asked here, some of these questions are specific to understanding the responses. And we just want to use this as the initial because not every single person that asks for this would want to have like a one on one call. But like if we get like the few persons to indicate interest um, for the further conversations, we can now sum it up with the with the response of this ones in the report. So if the if the demographic information is connected directly to the questions and we will be anal analyzing uh, those things together, then I would say that the this is it's more than just a, a survey to scout interview subjects. It is it is uh, it's not just an initial screening. It's it's definitely part of the uh, an important part of the uh, and possibly a key part of the interview slash survey. So it's uh, if, if uh, the way if as if it's a if it's just an open survey to scout for interview subjects, then as it's written there, then then my anticipation is that the we wouldn't be reporting demographic information and we wouldn't be analyzing that demographic information uh, in relationship to responses. So this this is kind of the, the demographic bit feels like this is a key cog. Uh. So, um, are there any thoughts on this so far? Like, any other additions to this, to what Kevin just said? Uh, perhaps, perhaps we could provide some example questions that could uh, fill in for the uh, which racial ethnic background do you identify with and what gender spectrum do you identify with? Maybe that would be helpful. Yes, um, you can drop that in the in the document as a suggestion, so we can discuss on that too. All right. Um, so, um, Sophia's suggestions that um, if we want to collect this survey, and um, you know the question where we say please provide your online contact if you're willing to participate in the follow-up conversations. So, Sophia is asking if this would not make the if this would make the the entire form no longer anonymous. So I just want to know, should we still, if we don't um, ask this question in the survey, how else can we get in contact with, um, with the participants? Or is there any other way we could get in contact with participants if we don't get to request for their contact information at all in the, in the form? Uh, so I think it only it only de, uh, de anonymizes the data if the email is connected to the data. So if you if you grab it and send that email address to a different place, uh, then then that would be a, a way of of maintaining kind of the the anonymity and as as much as we can. Uh, in this document, so if, if you're creating if you're creating a form to collect this data, maybe the 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 survey interview data is sent to one place, and then uh, when you collect the email address, you just send that to a different place. 
All right. So having like um, a spreadsheet where this to be put would help. Uh, I'm just, what survey what survey tool do you plan on using to to do this have you looked at that yet for like the i'm using line survey that's the tool i'm currently using okay uh So I'm, I'm not familiar with that tool, so I don't know if that's possible, but basic, the, the basic idea is that you need to, in order to maintain anonymity on this, you need for, in regards, very specifically in regards to the email, collecting the email, is you need to, you need to separate the data collection, right? So you don't want the, you don't want your email to go to the same place as the rest of the data. Okay. Uh, or if it does go there, you want to you want to scrub it out, and remove it before you do the data analysis. So the the easiest way to make sure that they're that they're never connected would be to send that email address to a different place when you're collecting it, right? So the uh, so there are two ways to do that. One is to if the form allows you to uh, send it to a different target. If the form tool allows you to send it to a different target, perhaps you can send it, collect it uh, as an email, uh, or put it into a put it into a, a different kind of uh, database. Uh, alternately, you could provide some directions, like you could provide a link at the bottom of the the email that says uh, if you want to uh, if you want to participate email me right and you uh you can have an email link that'll that would connect to your email address uh and just ask them to uh send an email that says i want to participate so if you do that then the then that participation email wouldn't be connected to the data that you've just collected and you wouldn't have any way of you yourself as a researcher wouldn't have any way of of connecting it back together does that make sense yeah so that, that would be the, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I'm really confused though, because I thought that the point of the initial survey was to identify folks for the interviews and that like you would use the information from their first survey in that interview. Is that not true? Yes. Um, however, the question is, if we um, request for their contact information, it might reduce the anonymity of the survey. That's what we're trying to um, debate how to go about this. So you want that first part to be completely anonymous, but also allow for us to contact them? Because then at that yeah. point, then it's not anonymous, obviously, because they're getting interviewed and recorded and yeah so okay yeah i think i understand and there are kind of two so places where we can think about anonymity uh, one of them is on the the front end where we want to avoid uh kind of researcher bias and we want to uh kind of let people know that it's safe for them to take the survey and that they're their data isn't going to be shared. Uh, and then the second place we, 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 we can start to think about anonymity is in the analysis of the data. Uh, so, and, and there, those are two kind of different things. With a survey, you kind of want to, you want to focus on anonymity at the front end. And with interviews, you want to focus on anonymity at the back end. Right. So if you're doing an interview with someone, you're going to know who that person is as a researcher. So the way that you the way that you need to assure anonymity there is it happens after you've interviewed that person. Right. Where you go in and you remove names and you remove references to things that could be that that could identify them. Uh, so that so they're kind of these two different places that you need to think about anonymity uh, in the in that first one that uh, Sophia mentions, that's anonymity 
on the data collection that that first part, the data collection part, and that and that comment is made very specifically uh, because because we're looking at survey data, and when you're encouraging people to fill out surveys, they often don't want to be identified. So you need to make sure that you're you're collecting it in a way that uh, that they can rest assured that they're that the responses that they are giving you aren't going to be recorded connected to any personal information. Right. So uh, on, when we talk about the interviews, it's a it's a different kind of anonymity, right, because we by, by necessity, we know who these people are when we interview them at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So um, however, at the beginning of the interview, I added a privacy note indicating that um, information collected will not be um, associated with um, their, will not be in any way connected to these persons that are rendering this interview. So like, does that cover this in any way? Or I should also include it in the um, question, the particular question as well. Would that help? While I then add my email there. So email me if you want to be contacted. I think that seems reasonable, but I'm not an expert, so I don't, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't. Okay. I do know we're at the end of time, so um, we can continue this next time if that's okay with everybody. All right, um, so um, Kevin, if I rephrase this, I'll send you a message in the Slack so you could go over it as well, and then we'll talk about it in the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much, Anita, for your work here, and Kevin, for your insights. Enoch and Victoria, we will see you next time, hopefully. Um, yeah, everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.